Um, so I think we're good to begin. So a very good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, so our second webinar for the day is Understanding the Science Behind Climate Change. Um, our speakers for today are Rebecca and Angraj. Uh, firstly, a quick thank you to the both of you for doing this today. We appreciate your time and uh, efforts. Um, so uh, a quick introduction about Rebecca. She works in the Earth Observation Science Department at the University uh, in UK. Her PhD involves testing and developing new systems for identifying different types of planetary boundary layer. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And um, our second uh, speaker for today is Angraj. Uh, he is an astrophysicist at the Space Research Center in England. And uh, he is, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, my just my phone conked off. I'm sorry. Uh, can I hand this over to you? So you can begin with uh, the webinar. And if you could like to add something about yourself, because my phone is conked off, I'm so sorry. That's okay, don't worry about it. Um, just give me a shout if you can hear me so I can get some kind of a feedback, otherwise I might be talking to myself. So can everyone hear me clearly? Is there any, is there any way for you to say yes or no? Uh, maybe people can uh, put a thumbs up in, uh, in the that, chat. That's fine, box. I think um, I've, got, I've got Rebecca who's, who's, yeah, who's on. Yeah, I can hear you yeah. fine. Yeah, that's fine, if you can hear me, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Uh, so yeah, so thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Angaraj. Uh, I'm an astrophysicist here in Leicester Space Research Center. Um, so essentially, I'm not a climate scientist. Um, my work is with space instrumentation. I worked on NASA's near space imaging mission. Uh, Rebecca is the main speaker, I would say, for today, because she is actually a climate scientist. Um, but what I wanted to do was um, the whole idea of climate science. Um, we have heard politicians talk about it. We have heard activists talk about it. Um, but a scientist's perspective is slightly different. And that's what I wanted to put forward today uh, in my talk. Um, we are not policymakers. We don't make policies. We don't tell people what to do, what not to do. We, we just provide our, our results. We provide our facts. Um, it's up to the policymakers to do what they want to do. One of the biggest questions that people ask us as scientists is why should we trust scientists? Why do we think that whatever a scientist says is correct? Um, and that's the answer I wanted to question today. Rebecca will talk more about the, the science behind the climate physics, the actual data that she has been working on. Whereas my talk will be just to tell you how we build those instruments that from where we get the data. So I'll share the screen, um, and if just one of you tell me if you can see clearly or not. Um, so how do I share it? So share. Um, da, 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 da. I'm just give me a second. I'm trying to share the screen. There's a little green button down at the bottom. Yeah, it says whiteboard and document. Why does it say document? <laughs> um, give me one second. So let's see if you can see this clearly. No, that's just a document. Okay. Share mm. computer sound. Ah, okay. So, can you all see my? It's just loading. Yeah. Yeah. Can you all see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So essentially, when we have a space mission, um, so every data that we have got so far um, for climate physics from space, we, we build a satellite, we put it under a rocket, and then we launch it, right? And this is quite well known in the general public because the news channels will always cover this. Um, now, just to begin with what I work on, so I work on detection of gamma rays from space. I'm not going to talk about that because that's not really the topic today. But um, there's a very close relation between what we do while looking into space and while looking down at Earth. And that relation is usually the instruments that we use, right? So when we, when we launch a satellite, 
uh, something like this, what you see in the screen. There are two things a satellite can do. It can either look up, and when it looks up, I mean, if you want to learn about a black hole or a nearby planet or a nearby stars, then we look up. And those are essentially space satellites that, that, that are used for astrophysics purposes. But then there's another division of, um, of, of satellites where we use the satellites to look down. The instruments at the end of the day are the same. The procedure is same. The only difference is that particular satellite has been built to look down at Earth and monitor Earth. Because um, that gives, gives us a vantage point if we can see it from high up, from space, from orbit. Now, what people don't realize is there's a very long procedure from where, from, from the day you first decide that you want to do some climate science work to the day where you actually launch the satellite and you start working on the mission. And that's what I'm going to talk through very briefly. The host. So Angaraj, on the share screen, you can have that option that uh, the only the host can share screen. Can you see that settings? Uh, I think I have I have done that, yeah. You have done that, then I can I think you can move ahead. So I went to security and I have, uh, yeah. Should I go ahead or? I think you can move ahead if others have no problem. I think you can- Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Okay, that's fine. So, okay, so that was a minor detour, funny one if anything. <laughs> So, um, right, so, so as I was saying, we use satellites to look down on Earth. Um, and the reason why, why we trust in this process is what I'm gonna talk about for the next few minutes, right? So whenever we build a satellite, we build them in a clean room condition to begin with, okay? Uh, this means that there's a very strict procedure to what we put into orbit. There are certain rules and there are certain international agreements. It's not done by one agency, it's not just NASA or ISRO or UK Space Agency, it's basically a, a group of agencies who have certain procedures we follow. So for example, if you see in this photo in the back, that's one of the satellites that we were building uh, to look at the weather, not on Earth, but on Mercury. But as I said, the process is ultimately the same. Uh, we take it out of the lab, we put it in our rocket, and then it does its job. So what I want to share here is the procedure that I'm talking about, right? So one of the main questions that people ask is, okay, these images that we see from satellites, how do we know they are not fake or they are not manipulated? And the simple answer to that is, there's a very long process and there are a lot of people and a lot of filtration process involved where it's very hard or almost impossible to fake all of this. So let me explain you what that procedure is, what the scientific method is. This is for any science, right? So the first step is we have an idea, okay? We have a group of scientists who come up with an idea. That could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be in a lab. It could be in a pub as well. Um, the second step is when we have this idea, we need to have a mathematical um, description of that idea. It has to be math mathematically proven. Finally, we write a paper on this. And this is where your biggest obstacle comes for a scientist. You cannot fluke through fake science because it will be peer reviewed by all the other scientists. And one of the main job in this peer review is to make sure that all other scientists will try to disapprove your theory, right? And this is the stage where if you have produced something that does not have concrete evidence, it will be straight away moved away. Finally, if you have gone through this peer review process, then you have published your theory. But your job doesn't end here, especially in climate science. In climate science, if we want to launch a satellite that would give you data about, about your, your weather or whatever, there's another step to it. You have to compete with other missions. And then amongst those missions, one of them is accepted to be launched as a climate satellite. Okay. So this is what I try to explain whenever I give a talk on climate science. So whenever you see images like this, now when Rebecca comes in, she'll talk further about the climate science data. But a lot of people pose this question, why, how do we know that these images that we are seeing, be it glacier melting or cyclones or temperature rising, how do we know that this data is not manipulated? And here's the answer. All the processes that, that I've spoken through so far, at any stage, if one group of scientists by any reason or for any reason wants to fake it, you will be stopped by your peer reviews because this whole process takes more than just a year or two years. The whole mission takes almost 10 years to go through, right? 
So Rebecca, I think we'll come from here and talk about what these images mean and as a climate scientist, what she does on a day-to-day -day basis. So Rebecca, do you wanna join in from here? Yeah, if you can stop sharing your screen. Yeah. Right, I think I've removed all our unwanted guests. Um, hmm. If you can just keep an eye out for them because that was very distracting, but we'll, <laughs> We'll, we'll see we'll see how we go. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Rebecca, as Angaro said. Um, I'm a climate scientist. So uh, I was just gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, what we get in terms of um, pollution data and how we analyze it from a climate scientist perspective. Um, so I first decided that I wanted to become a climate scientist a couple of years ago. Um, I originally come from a physics and astrophysics background. So I studied my um, undergraduate and my master's here at the University of Leicester. And then during my final year, I was lucky enough to do a project on a particle called black carbon. And for that, I um, went on to look at aerosols, which I'll explain a bit about later. And uh, from that, I got really interested in the health and climate effects of different pollutants in the atmosphere. Um, so being a climate scientist is kind of very um, varied as a field. You can't be an expert in everything. So there's people that study um, carbon dioxide levels. Uh, there's people that study things like uh, nitrogen dioxide. Um, and for me, I study aerosols. So Aerosols are kind of a overlooked part of the atmosphere, um, I think, and they do have a lot of very detrimental health and environment effects. So I feel like the awareness of aerosols needs to be raised quite a bit, which is what I'm gonna try and do today. Um, I'm gonna try and share my screen now and hope that I don't get any strange things on it. <laughs> okay, give me one moment. Trying to remember how to do this. Uh, uh, that. Nope. Okay. Uh, can everybody see that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I thought I'd start off and um, show you a little bit of um, context as to where aerosols fit in in the grand scheme of things. I think the best way to describe an aerosol is it's basically a particle. It could be pretty much anything that is suspended in the atmosphere. So we have um, things like dust particles that come from um, like deserts. We have marine aerosols from oceans. We also have man-made, so anthropogenic aerosols like um, black carbon and organic carbon. And we also have certain kinds of aerosols um, that are formed through chemical reactions in the atmosphere. So um, things like sulfates and nitrates, which I will talk a little bit more about later. Um, so first off, if I can move forward on the slides. Can't, oh, yeah. Uh, so this is some data from the International Panel of Climate Change uh, that was released a few years ago now. It looks quite complicated, but it, um, it's basically just showing um, different compounds in the atmosphere and how they contribute to the warming or the cooling effect of the atmosphere. So basically how they directly or indirectly contribute to climate change. So at the very top, you can see um, carbon dioxide and methane, which are both very high contributors to the warming effect of the atmosphere. Um, we also have um, compounds of nitrogen and other kinds of carbonaceous compounds. But about halfway down the image, you can see the aerosols and their precursors. So this is the part of the um, atmospheric composition that I'm really interested in. As you can see, the aerosols can influence it either positively or negatively. 
um, but the uncertainty in these measurements are really, really large. So part of my PhD project is to try and reduce the uncertainties in the effects that these aerosols have on the environment. Um, so I'll explain a little bit about what my project specifically is. So I am both a um, modeling physicist, um, scientist, and an experimental scientist. So my PhD is basically half and half. So these are a couple of images of um, the work that I've been doing in my lab. Um, basically, I am designing and um, building a new ground-based instrument to look at these aerosol particles um, and to be able to differentiate between them in the atmosphere. Um, so in very simple terms, I'm using the properties of different wavelengths of light. So I'm using lasers, very high power light beams, um, shooting them into the sky and then measuring with a detector how like the signal, the amount of signal that I get back from each of these aerosol particles. And then when you analyze that data, you can have a look and see what kind of aerosols we have up there and um, where they come from and how long they've been up in the atmosphere for. And the more knowledge that we have on these aerosols, the more um, able we are to help minimize their effects, to reduce the climate impacts and to reduce the health impacts. Um, so I've got a couple of schematics now, um, just showing you the amount of aerosol that we have in the atmosphere. So this is a really cool schematic from NASA a few years ago and it details the two, four of the main um, aerosol types and their positions around the world. So we have marine aerosols, which are in blue. So things like sea salt, they're obviously present over the oceans. We have dust particles, which come from equatorial regions and deserts. Uh, we also have in white at the top, we have our sulfates. So things like sulfates and nitrates, as I mentioned earlier, they're formed not, they are not directly emitted from a source. They are formed by chemical reactions in the atmosphere and they are generally um, man-made uh, precursors which then uh, have the chemical reactions. So they're more present in uh, places like Europe and East Asia. And finally, we have the carbonaceous aerosols, so um, organic and black carbon. These are can be emitted both through natural sources and man-made sources. So things such as um, uh, vehicle exhausts and residential cooking and burning are all examples of big black carbon emitters. Um, and the ones that we can see across Africa and parts of South America are um, organic and black carbon aerosols being emitted through um, things like biomass burning and wildfires. So basically black carbon is one of the hardest aerosols to track and it's in the most places, which makes it really, really interesting, but also very difficult to pin down. Um, one thing as well, so this um, schematic is take, was taken over the course of three or four days and one thing that struck me when I was looking at it was how far aerosols can be transported across the world. So they can start in one place and um, a couple of days later, they could be on another continent. So that causes quite a lot of problems, which is another part of my um, PhD project consideration. It causes lots of problems in the fact that, um, especially in parts of South U Southern Europe, um, things like dust aerosols from the Sahara are getting transported over the course of a few hours from the desert up above um, these countries and also other man-made emitted aerosols are traveling from their place of origin to another place um, in another country. And that means that when the um, countries do calculations as to how much aerosol is in their atmosphere above their country, they're getting fined for it because they are producing or there there is more aerosol than the upper limits say so and they're getting fined for it so they can't prove that a lot of these aerosols are emitted in their country but they're still getting penalized for it so the more way more um 
knowledge we have on these aerosols and about their transport and everything, the more we're able to help reduce some of these fines potentially and um, reduce some of the blame put on these countries. So this is some data that I was um, working on looking at um, PM10 and PM2.5 concentrations. So PM10 and PM2.5 are just ways of classifying um, aerosols by size. So PM10 aerosols are below 10 micrometers in diameter, which is really, really it's tiny. And PM2.5 likewise is um, particles less than 2.5 micrometers. Um, so as you can see, um, both the World Health Organization and the EU as a government body have both um, uh, made uh, restrictions on how much con how much concentration of um, these aerosol pollutants a country can have and looking especially at the PM10 concentrations it seems that countries in southern Europe such as um, Italy and Turkey and Greece are all struggling with higher levels of particulate matter which comes most likely from um, dust plumes and dust storms from the Saharan desert so I'm hoping that, um, so I work with a partner company in Athens in Greece, and I've been out there working a few times to see um, if I can do something about reducing the amount of, um, of uh, dust pollution that uh, Greece has to include in its pollution budget. So this is another schematic. This is just looking at aerosol, something, a property called um, aerosol optical depth, which is just a measure of how much aerosol is in the atmosphere at a given time. The black parts on the graph are where, um, where cloud cover prevented measurements from being taken place. I think these came from one of the satellites that Angraj was talking about in his talk. So this is over the course of a few days and you can see the plume of um, dust coming in from the Sahara Desert and going up above Southern Europe. Um, and I included this schematic as well. So this is a very similar thing, but it's looking at uh, PM10. So uh, this shows just all across Southern Europe and occasionally you get really bright flares coming in from the Saharan Desert um, in the South. And um, there's one, really really big one that sort of sweeps across the whole of Europe and the rate obviously the um, pollution budget of all those countries will have shot up when this gigantic dust storm basically swept over and um, covered the whole continent there it is so this was actually over um, the last month so this is this is up to date so um, I was having a look at this because I wanted to have some current data because as obviously the world circumstances as it is at the moment, air pollution is currently experiencing a rapid drop um, to the point that we've never seen it before. We, we don't really know how to even begin analyzing this data yet, but I thought I'd help, um, I'd ha try and um, describe some of the ways that air pollution has changed since the uh, outbreak of the coronavirus. So, this is moving on a little bit from aerosols and instead focusing on nitrogen dioxide, so NO2. Now, I'm not an expert in this at all, but um, I can describe this quite well, that NO2 basically is a um, anthropogenically emitted aerosol. So you would expect with more human activity that you would have higher levels of NO2. And this um, is, uh, some data from uh, January on the left hand side and then February on the right hand side looking at the same area over China and you can see since the coronavirus lockdown how much of that NO2 density has decreased it's almost barely visible in China at the moment um, so as I say I'm not an expert in NO2 but um, I can imagine similar things are happening with other kinds of pollutants as well so it's uh, good for the earth um, I guess to have a decrease in these levels of pollutants. Um, it's also happening across other parts of the world as well so this is some um, data from uh, NASA oh sorry ESA I believe the European Space Agency this was focused mainly on looking at the levels of NO2 pollution above northern Italy um, before and after the lockdown uh, just in the center there, as you can see on the left-hand image, the um, 
levels of NO2 were absolutely highest in Northern Italy. And um, on the right hand side, you can see they've gone down a lot uh, again due to the lockdown. Um, and finally, in America as well, we, this is NO2 again, because um, it's the easiest to, um, we have the most satellites looking for NO2 at the moment. So this is on the East Coast. Um, the averages between 2015 and 2019 are in the top image. As you can see, the levels on the coast are much higher than they are at the same time this year. And on the right, I thought I'd include something from a press release about um, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so the ozone, uh, amount of ozone has increased, but the amount of carbon dioxide, particulate matter and aerosols has been gone, going down by a significant percentage. Um, so I just thought I'd include some, um, some of these diagrams just to show how sudden and turbulent, I guess, air pollution is and um, how much it's changed over the world in the last month. Um, so Angaraj and I, um, did quite short talks, um, as he already said. Um, so I believe uh, we'll be open to any questions and we will try our best to answer them. Um, and I feel like I should, I think maybe the host should unmute people or I, I'm sorry, I'm very new to Zoom. <laughs> um, so yeah, so yeah, so what Rebecca said, uh, all the data she, she showed, um, the reason why I wanted to start with the satellite building part of it is because Quite often, I mean, all this data is available for the public, but even then we still have a major chunk of people who don't believe in climate change. And the main reason is probably because when you show them these graphs or these images, they they have this um, idea of conspiracy theories in their head. And, and my idea was to prove that it's not that easy to fake um, science, even if I wanted to. Uh, and hypothetically, if you, if you think of a group of scientists who say might want to corrupt the data, they can't because it goes through a global network of uh, scientists from all over the world who check these processes. And so it's not easy to, so you can't just take a image of a map and put it on MS Paint and say, here's the air pollution going up. That's just not possible. But yeah, as I said, we keep our talks um, short. I thought there'd be more people who would be interested to ask questions. So whoever is the host of Fridays for Future, do you want to take over and tell us what questions people might have? Oh, okay, so we've got questions on the, you can ask directly with the audio as well, if you want, by the way. So I'm not sure how to do that. I think I've unmuted people. Okay. Um, so there's questions on in the chat at the moment, which I can try to answer. Yeah. And so one of them is, um, we see a lot of change in climate in 2020. What will happen when the lockdown ends? Um, I guess that depends on um, the, society as a whole. I unfortunately believe that um, most likely pollution levels will rise again to the state that they were before the lockdown. Ideally, that would not be the case. Um, it would hopefully be more people realizing that despite all of this um, confusion and uncertainty, at least some good is happening in terms of a reduction of air pollution. However, I think as a society, because we rely so much on um, technology, um, fossil fuels and all that, um, that the air pollution will go back to regular levels. It will just be, um, when we look back on the data in a few years, it will very likely be a graph that's constant and then a dip for the lockdown and then an, in an increase again, excuse me. Um, but I couldn't say for sure. Um, it may be possible that with a big enough effort, it will help to um, permanently reduce some kinds of levels. We just don't know yet. Um, tell us the relation between aerosols and change in climate. Uh, are aerosols good for cooling our planet? Okay. Um, so as I mentioned in my talk, aerosols are very um, uncertain, we're, we're very uncertain in exactly what kind of things they do. So aerosols themselves have both direct and indirect effects on climate, which is what makes them so um, basically confusing. So the direct effects are the fact that they um, absorb and scatter um, 
the sun's rays, um, so a bit like carbon dioxide. So things like black carbon are very absorbing and lead to a warming of the climate. Um, black carbon also um, has an indirect effect. It can um, settle on places with um, high reflectivity, such as um, like snowy areas, um, like the Arctic and the Antarctic. And it causes, um, not visibly, but um, from an optical perspective, if you look um, in a certain kind of wavelength, you can actually see that these areas then become more absorbing and also increase um, this uh, warming effect of the earth. Um, however, some aerosol properties, um, some aerosols, I should say, are also um, highly scattering. So things like um, desert dust and in some, some kinds of sea salt and marine aerosols, um, these are scattering aerosols, so they will actually cool the climate down. Um, but again, because of this massive uncertainty in all of these, we don't actually fully understand whether they can be used to um, heat or cool the atmosphere. At the moment, there is a net heating effect, which is global warming, um, but we're not. <laughs> Basically, it's just very, very um, difficult to quantify at the moment. Um, I hope that answers your question. Someone, Someone's moving. unmuted everybody. Sorry. Uh, I think people who wants to ask question can unmute. Uh, it's already unmuted. People who don't have anything to speak, please mute yourselves. Whenever you have a question, you can ask. Uh, we've got a question in the chat as well. I'm currently doing an undergraduate degree in chemistry. If I wanted to become a climate scientist, what course would you recommend for a postgraduate degree? I think there are more um, in, in the climate, climate science group. So, um, so I think most of the, I mean, things that Rebecca and her colleagues and our colleagues work on, quite a few of them are chemists. I think Rebecca is the only one who's an astrophysicist, which is- a, <laughs> Yes, I am. Um, but yeah, so I think if you, if you are doing a degree in chemistry, I think you are in an absolute right path. Uh, with both all your masters or your PhD, I would suggest you can, you can look up ones that are more related to earth observation of climate physics. Uh, I think we would readily take a chemist um, given given your background. Yeah, um, I'm a bit strange in the fact that I um, came to this through a astrophysics background. So mine was purely coincidental in the fact that I happened to choose a, um, a climate physics project in my master's year, which then springboarded me to meet my current um, postgraduate supervisor and then eventually led me on to do this PhD. Um, I would say chemistry is possibly the main one if you're wanting to get into climate. Um, also things like, um, I guess, any sort, any sort of science um, because climate physics is, or climate um, studies just in general is, um, it's a massive interdisciplinary field. So you can do, you can just use a range of skills. There's so many different things you can do. Um, but yeah, keep going in in a chemistry degree, and you'll you'll probably find a place somewhere. I think someone asked about how can we make people realize climate change is a real thing. Um, again, my opinion there is, I believe the most important thing here. I might be a bit biased as a scientist, but the most important thing here is obviously the science. Um, it's very important. Look, I don't think. Um, straight away, asking people to completely change their lifestyle in one day is a is a practical solution. I mean, yes, if we shut down all the industries that's causing pollution, you would, you would solve the the climate change crisis. But there's going to be too many people who'd be out of their jobs, and you, you know, it's going to completely uh, bring an unbalance. So there has to be a list of um, solutions towards this problem and those solutions can't be too drastic it has to be taken over time but i think the most important one is to first understand what is our timeline we can't just say by 2025 everyone's going to die you know the earth is going to die that's not really a good idea um, i think that's why it's very important to um to to understand the science and understand the timeline the the, the data that rebecca showed from her research, it's very important for the general public who is not necessary from a physics or science background to understand what they are. Um, I think one of the drastic changes I've seen here in England is, I remember four years ago, um, there was a massive movement on um, using plastic straws. 
And just within a span of two years, I've seen almost every um, restaurant or pub using, um, using um, straws that are not plastic. So I think those are kind of steps you would take slowly and gradually while understanding the underlying principle of science. Uh, and also you need to understand that um, the science always improves. We always have better instruments. So the satellite that we have used, the satellite that Rebecca used for her research 10 years down the line, we will we definitely will build an instrument that will be 100 times more sensitive, 100 times higher resolution, will give us even better results. Quite often people use this as, a, as an excuse to refute science. They say, you know, scientists said something else five years ago, five years from now, they're gonna say something else. Of course, that's gonna change because, you know, our instruments, the tools that we use, um, just like our mobile phones, um, change with time. So, so yeah, that, that's my mm -hmm. answer to your question about what people can do. There's a yeah. there's a question from on the YouTube chat. They're asking, I think this is Fangaraj. It says, how many climate satellites are currently up there and why do we need so many of them? Oh yeah, so I don't know the exact number. There's quite a few actually. As I said, to begin with, it's not just one agency doing it. That's what you need to understand. It's not just NASA, it's not just ISRO. It's not just one agency doing it, it's a group of agencies doing separately to begin with, right? So NASA has launched one satellite that, that specializes in one. ESA has launched one that specializes in one. And as Rebecca said, when you say climate science, it's not just air pollution, it's not just CO2. Uh, different satellites have different spe specialization. Um, sometimes what happens is, as I said, make a space mission takes almost 10 years or seven to 10 years to happen. So if something was launched, or if, some, if, a, if a mission began in 1995, it was probably launched in 2002. And while that was happening, probably another group of scientists came up with a better instrument. And that again was launched in 2009 or so. So one, different satellites are used for different purposes. As I said, you can't have one satellite to look into climate, that, that's not a thing. And secondly, it's the improvement. You have the instruments that, that are constantly improving and you want to launch another one. In the next 10 years, there'll probably be a few more satellites that will give us a complete better picture of what Rebecca just showed. So that's why you need that many. You can't just have one or two, if that answers it, the person's question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Akshay has a question. Akshay, can you unmute yourself now? Yeah, 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 I can. Okay. Thank you. Please go on. Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, hello, Angraj and Rebecca. Thank you for such an informative session. Uh, I'm Akshay. My question is, you mentioned about uncertainty of aerosols. Uh, and also, I read a report in which IPCC had read, uh, repeatedly identified the cooling effects of pollutant aerosols as largest uncertainty amongst factors of climate change. So my question is, where do you see this progress in this decade of action that is till 2030? Thank you. I'm sorry, you cut out a tiny bit there. Could you repeat that? Yeah, the prediction of your aerosol uh, results by 2030, what do you think is going to happen? I think that's what he asked. In yeah, yeah, that, yeah. A prediction of how aerosols are going to change or yeah. by 2030? Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, very similar to my answer to my last question, I think. Um, it's impossible to say, um, <laughs> which is, I don't know, not very helpful, I'm afraid. Um, so, there's been a lot of research um, recently, so a lot of people in my department and departments up and down the UK are working on um, uh, looking at aerosol research. So we are attempting to um, implement preventative measures. So um, notably as well, um, Canada is one of the ones that is focusing a lot on reducing black carbon emissions. Um, it was su it's surprising actually how um, reductions of greenhouse gases emissions and reduction of aerosol emissions actually go hand in hand because they're often emitted by the same things. Um, so we can't prevent uh, natural causes like um, dust storms or wildfires, but in terms of the anthropogenic side, there's been a lot of pushes to um, reduce residential, um, like residential cooking fumes, to switch to electric cars, to use renewable energy fuels. Um, I think there was a question in the chat a little bit earlier as well that was also talking about um, how can I personally reduce um, aerosol emissions. The, the ways to do it are also very similar to um, how to reduce um, use of fossil fuels and how to um, remove things like carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well. So um, yeah, very, very similar, but 
Um, in terms of an outlook in 2030, um, it will take a lot of, it will take a big, big effort worldwide to reduce these. So if enough people were to do it, then we would be able to see a reduction in these emissions. Um, but um, unfortunately, as, as, um, as it's currently looking, possibly not see too much change in the future. Hope that answers. Um, and sort of answers. I think the next, oh. <laughs> the next question, okay. Uh, oh, Mahesh wants to ask something. Mahesh, yes, can I yeah. just ask one question I got? Uh, okay, okay. Go on, go on, okay. go on. I shall be. Yeah, then you can ask yours. Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, someone is asking about the space debris kind of waste management. So is anything happening That's over there? That's <laughs> So whoever asked that question was probably not going to like what I'm about to say. <laughs> SpaceX has just launched um, 348 satellites in one go, and they plan to launch another 12,000 satellites called Starlink. It's actually more than 12,000, I think. Um, the main purpose of those satellites is for internet in remote areas. So space junk is a massive problem. As scientists, we are not very proud of it because we caused it. Um, having said that, as I said, um, you always have, whenever you have drawbacks like this, for example, space junk is one of them, we always have another group of people who looks into it. I remember when I was in university, in fact, when I was final year uh, of my degree, um, my one of the projects I was given was to look into this. We worked with, um, with Airbus, Airbus Defense and Space is one of the space industries in the UK, and they wanted us to find a potential solution um, to uh, to space junk. Um, one of them was one use materials that can easily be burned in the atmosphere because if you burn in the atmosphere it doesn't come to the surface it doesn't harm as much. Um, but yeah so that to be very honest with you it is a problem. I will not say that it's going to be solved in the next couple of years or so. The best thing I can say is um, that yes um, it is a problem and people are looking into it. Um, and if I show you, I don't have it with me right now. If I show you a, a, an image of the space junk, it'll probably scare you a lot because it is quite a lot. Uh, and yes, as Ritik said in the chat, it's, it's way more than 12,000. I think it's going to go up to 30,000 30, 30, for the Starlink. Thank you. Mahesh, you can go on with your question. Uh, hi, uh, Angraj and Rebecca. Uh, thanks a lot for you know taking your time. Uh, so basically, my question was revolving around the same space debris. So even you know China's uh, Tiangong uh, you know crashed in, back into the earth, and you know there are uh, you know constellations that you know actually cause a lot of heavy traffic in the you know lower Earth orbits or the geosynchronous. So I've heard like you know we actually depend on the game theory, like you know dynamic game theory or evolutionary game theory to you know deal with these space debris and all. So uh, how effectively are we planning it? Are there you know what do you suggest being a you know physicist? Uh, do you think that we need uh, any you know uh, proper uh, agenda from the international organizations to consider this or an action or a policy, you know, to deal with the space debris? We definitely do. I mean, um, and to a great extent, we already have. So for example, it's not for low Earth orbit, because I know things are going really bad. So for people who don't know about this, there are different orbits where we put our satellites. Uh, as the person who asked the question mentioned, low Earth orbit is where we usually put our satellites that we use for, you know, internet or... Um, but we do have very strict rules. For example, now we are looking towards going to Mars, right? And NASA, ESA, all these agencies, we are working on sending rovers to Mars. And we actually took this step way early. When we send things to another planet, we have very strict space laws on what to send, what we can send, what materials we use. Regarding space debris, uh, as I said, I think in next 10 years or so, um, the, the, the rules are going to be a bit more strict. I hope so, at least. I mean, I, I mean, SpaceX got the, got the approval to launch all, um, all the satellites. I mean, the other thing is when you have issues like this, um, it's not one-sided, you know, uh, we, we do need the satellites, but if, if you want to monitor climate, if you want to provide internet in remote areas, you know, this is, this is an important step for us to take. And this is where you need to balance pros and cons. And this is where, policy making comes into play. But as a scientist, what I would say is what we do is, so, you know, in my talk, I mentioned that we have a procedure when we build a satellite and we, when we launch it, that procedure keeps updating. And my suggestion or my hope is that in next 10 years time, 
um, there will be a, a procedure in that satellite making where they would state, okay, tell me once you launch the satellite, how are we bringing it back or how are we deorbiting it without causing any space debris? Um, I don't have any concrete rules with me right now, but but uh, but all I can say is that is definitely that, that is definitely a path that uh, people who are working on space missions are taking, um, and and it's it's kind of similar to what what what's happening in climate physics as well, isn't it? It's because so many people are being aware of a problem, that's when we start taking a step towards the problem. So I think we, even with the space debris or with climate physics, um, that is that is the route we take. If that answers your question. Uh, yes, Angraj. Uh, thank you. Thank you. But uh, uh, the reason as to why it, uh, you know brought this you know to the committee right now is you know even when US actually passed this uh, you know uh, the Outer Space Treaty, uh, we could see that the private companies are actually you know like not really under the umbrella or the consideration of this treaty, which enables you know organizations such as SpaceX and Elon Musk to actually you know launch 300 plus satellites in one go. So is the, isn't that a concern? And you know with the Angong actually crashing back to the Earth. That's why, you know, are you pretty yeah, much there, there, It definitely is a concern. And the other thing is you mentioned that private space industry is relatively new. I'm not saying it, it happened last year, but if you look at the space timeline, um, SpaceX and, you know, all the other private space industries, they have, they have, you know, they unexpectedly came up quite, quite, you know, quite widespread. So when those rules were made, the ones that you mentioned, I assume, you know, private space industry was not taken into account. Uh, but now it is, uh, even if it's Virgin Galactic or whoever it is, they are making sure that the, that the rules do apply to, to private industries as well. But I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it's not a problem and we don't have to worry about it. It's definitely a problem and we definitely don't have a permanent solution to it yet. Um, especially looking at Starlink, which, which did really surprise me. I mean, as much as I'm excited to see how those satellites work, it is also concerning, um, you know, and... Um, but, but as I said, this is, it's one of the things people are looking into it. Uh, when we, for, the all, for all the upcoming missions, I would assume the laws are going to be more strict. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we were trying to deal with it as much as we can. One of the fun facts is for, for the astronauts who live on board, um, this is one of the conversations I've had with one of, one of the astronauts I've worked closely with. Um, he mentioned how the astronauts who live on the International Space Station um, their laundry, the laundry that they have, like dirty underwear, um, they actually chuck it towards the Earth's atmosphere. It gets dis disintegrated, but, um, but if you ever look up, uh, it's a good picture to have that you've got astronauts' underwear flying around. But they're very, very minor. They have been disintegrated, so you don't have to worry about it too much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the light moment. Uh, Rebecca and Angaraj, you have been a great sport. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, next, anyone wants to ask questions? I have one, but I'm waiting to first let others finish this. Uh, in the meantime, someone on YouTube had asked uh, Angaraj to show what's written on his T-shirt. So, <laughs> because <laughs> if there's anyone under 18, I shouldn't be showing this T-shirt. It's actually a physics joke. I, sh I just forgot that I shouldn't have worn it. It says, um, particle physics gives me a hadron. So I'm not sure if you can understand that joke. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's no, my gosh. Weird. Probably changed it. <laughs> oh. okay. okay, then since no one is asking, I'll go on with my question. Um, it's it's to Rebecca that uh, IPCC in its report had said about uh, reducing the air pollution levels to around 45% as compared to around 2007 or 2010 levels by 2030, mm -hmm. by 2030. So do you see anything happening in that part? Because people had signed the climate agreement and they do believe that things are not right. Uh, what do you mean? Do you think it's a feasible thing to do? No, I wanted to, I, I asked that, uh, is it, do you think that our pollution levels are going in the direction that we can even think of reduce our pollution by almost 45% the emissions by 2030? Again, it's uh, <laughs> unfortunately climate physics is very, um, a very uncertain um, field. Um, I think when they did make that policy, I think they had, I seem to recall reading that they had implemented the measures, or they had lots of measures that they wanted to implement in terms of getting them 
the um, levels down to 45% of what they were. But um, in terms of actually doing it, things things in science rarely work out the way you would expect, as I'm sure Angaraj can also agree with me. Um, you always run into some sort of problem, some sort of setback, and you have to rethink your ways of doing things. So I would say it's it's possible, um, but I'm not sure whether I feel it was quite ambitious for them to say that. But again, I'm not um, an expert on air quality policy by any stretch of the imagination. I work more with the the data side of it, so I don't think I can fully answer the question in the way that you would like, but I can only give my own personal opinion on it. It's also the unexpected things that you would you would see that would happen, like, you know, this global pandemic. No one thought, I mean, this, I, I'm mm. pretty sure no climate physicist took this pandemic into account. No one thought that there'll be a stage where the entire planet will be locked down. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, so that, that's, that's, that's what I would say. It's, there, there are a lot of factors that that come into play this is when this is the reason why and i've had this personally as well whenever i've given a, a public lecture and people ask me what do you think is going to happen in 2030 or 2040 or 2050 and my answer is we don't even know what's going to happen two years from now um so it's very hard to, we, we can make models we can make models based on how things would be if it continues the way it is right now but mm. that doesn't really happen in real life as you've seen um you never know. Six years time, there might be an industry that's booming a lot, helping the economy, but really degrading the climate or the other way around. So it's very hard to predict that far away. Um, but mm -hmm. the, I, would, I would say the best you can do is localize data. What I mean by that is look at when you see a graph, don't look at over a span of just 100 years. Sometimes you need to look into a more localized uh, time period on what you can do that would help immediately. So if that, if that, if I can add that. Yeah, and the problem with um, using atmospheric models to predict things in the future is that there are so many things that you have to assume. You have to assume constant rates of certain things. And that's just, it's just not real life. No matter how much we try and simulate real life um, circumstances, no matter what kind of physics or chemistry or anything that you're part of, um, it will never end up as you expect it to. Um, and as Angara said, global pandemic, nobody saw this coming. So um, that's definitely going to impact it in some way, but we just don't know what, so. Um, okay, Rebecca, <laughs> thank you. We have two questions uh, about aerosols. So one is uh, how long do aerosols stay in the atmosphere? Oh, okay. Interesting. <laughs> um, yep. So again, it varies depending on the type of aerosol. So um, one big, larger aerosols, so generally naturally um, emitted aerosols, such as dust and sea salts, they are larger um, and they tend to last a lot less time in the atmosphere. So dust particles tend to last sort of um, up to, four to maybe four to five days um, before they are basically rained out um back into um back down to the ground um other aerosols such as black carbon can have lifetimes of um between days and weeks and other aerosols can last even longer before they can degrade um so it's not quite as bad as carbon dioxide um but um smaller time frames which makes it again is another issue in terms of being able to um analyze them uh but yeah uh, up to um maybe a couple of months depending on the aerosol type okay um, um, just, just one more thing for um and obviously uh, climate physics is becoming a very hot topic for for everyone but um one them there are loads of resources uh, even from nasa but one of them i can suggest not being biased at all because i work for them uh, so lester earth observation science if you type that up lester earth observation science our eos group is um is quite um quite well known uh, and we have got quite a lot of um, scientific papers there if people are interested to to read them thank you um, I think the second question about aerosols aerosols is do aerosols have any connection to coral bleaching or ocean acidification on the chat box okay um, I 
unfortunately do nothing about marine biology or chemistry in any way so I genuinely don't know <laughs> I'm afraid uh, that is very much outside my area of expertise um, I would I would assume yes seeing as um, I can imagine anything that is in uh, the ocean that shouldn't be in the ocean will cause adverse effects whether that's to do with um, specifics like coral bleaching I'm not entirely sure um, but the sea salt aerosol itself is a naturally occurring one so that I can't see any reasons to why that would have an effect on it so it would just depend on the transport of anthropogenic aerosols into the ocean um, causing a change in ac acidity of the water or um, other negative effects like that so I, I don't know for sure again this is just speculation but yeah Unless Angaraj suddenly knows about marine biology. Nope. <laughs> Far from anyone us. else having any questions? Uh, yeah, so I think people have asked about the Lester. I'm just going to type it out. Uh, in the chat, they've asked what this Lester EOS is. So it's called Leicester Earth Observation Group. You'll see Rebecca's oh. photo on the website as well, because she's one of the mm -hmm. <laughs> physicists as well there. Um, so, so yeah, so it's called Leicester Earth Observation Science Group. Uh, we specialize in, in climate physics and in different aspects. So I've got people who are specializing in NO2, people who specialize in methane, um, global mm -hmm. precipitation measurement. Um, so there are different subdivisions of scientists who are working on, and as I said before, like, um, you know, climate physics is a massive umbrella. You can't, um, if you have a very spe uh, specialized question, it'll be hard for just one person to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, one person has been asking this question, though it's not very really related, but this is the third time he has asked this question. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of taking the request. It says, uh, without plastic, will we survive or not? Do you want to try this one, Angra? <laughs> <laughs> What's the question again? Without plastic, will we survive or not? What's your view? <laughs> <laughs> um, I can see he's asked that many times. On a day-to-day -day basis, of course. But here's the thing, right? So here's the thing. Of course, we need to find an alternative, OK? Um, because we know we have seen how plastic has harmed the environment. You don't need to be a scientist to know that. Um, but what I would say is, um, you can't straight away say, let's use paper bags, right? Because there are certain things that plastic can do that paper bags can't. However, I, and I've and I have read papers about this, there are chemists who are looking into plastics that, that are same material, but do not have as drastic effect as your usual plastic. So, and I think that's how it needs to work. Whenever you find something, a a thing that causes a harm to the environment, you can't just straight away go, let's ban this. Um, because you know that, that's not very practical. Uh, as scientists, what we do is we do further research onto it uh, and we try to remove the negative aspects of it. And same goes for plastic. I don't remember the, the exact group who was working on it, but I do know that there is a group of people who are working towards, um, towards using plastic or changing the way plastic behaves. Um, in fact, one of the one of the examples I would give was my last trip to India. Uh, this is where I met Shashendu, who's one of the founders of um, of the cleaning drive that's that's happening in Northeast India. Uh, we went to this factory who's who's using plastic to make bricks. Uh, so you know, this this is the kind of development that we want to see. Um, you know, it's very easy to say let's ban it. Um, but not very scientific. I think it's it's rather more important to look into alternatives that can do a similar function, but not as harmful, if that answers your question. I have something that I could um, I could add to that as well, uh, something more more for thought. Um, I don't know as to what time scale we could so could reasonably ban all plastics, um, but in the past we've lived without plastic, so. I see no reason why not in the future and um, technology is advancing at a rate we could definitely come up with some alternatives to it but it it's not going to be 
as Angra said, it's not just a sudden change. It's definitely something that will happen slowly over time, like with the banning of plastic straws in the UK. So now everywhere uses paper straws. It's small changes like that happening over a long period of time. Um, but in terms of could we survive without plastic? Definitely just not at the moment because of our dependency on it. I just want to add that. Thank you so much. So we have five minutes left. Anyone wants to ask any questions? But uh, meanwhile, what I would well, while some uh, please do interrupt if you have a question. But uh, since we have got five minutes, what what I would suggest is, I mean, obviously um, today's the audience we're talking to are all um, enthusiasts about climate physics, and they would all want to bring a change. Hence, we have organized uh, they have organized this um, this interaction. What I would say is, um, it's very very important to do a proper background research before jumping into a conclusion. Uh, for either way, even for those people who are supporting the whole climate change awareness. The reason why we need a strong background research is because otherwise it makes the case very loose. Um, and this has happened so many times uh, where I have, I've met people who were climate activists um, and they didn't have much idea about what was actually happening. And when I say I don't, they don't have idea, I don't mean they don't, they don't know the science. It's not important to know the science. But it's, it's important to know the result of the science. So what, what my suggestion to the, to the upcoming generation would be is to do a proper um, research if you're concerned about climate. And when I say research, not YouTube or Facebook or BuzzFeed, um, you need to use proper papers. Scientific papers are peer reviewed. They are, you know, as, as scientists, it's our job to disapprove our colleagues. Um, and so it goes through a very rigorous process. So if you are seeing a paper, a published paper, you have a certain level of trust on it because I'm not saying it's 100% correct, but I'm saying it, it has gone through a very strong peer review. Uh, so it's very important to have a strong background research if you are a climate activist. Um, same goes for policymakers. And, and, and the other thing is, as I said, it's very important to look at all sides of an issue uh, and I've said this before as well, uh, and I don't mean to, you know, um, when you say this industry is causing climate change, let's shut down this industry. It's not a very practical solution. It, it has other bad effects. Um, and so it's very important to know the pros and cons and very meticulously um, try to coming up, coming up with a solution is what, what I would say. Okay. So we'll end with two questions each to one of you. Yeah. One um, says, um, okay, I think this one first goes for Angadaj, the alternative for fuel propellant for launching rockets. Any views on that? So we have, uh, and it's actually there's a group in our, uh, in our group as well, who's looking into uh, nuclear propellant as well, because, uh, you know, <laughs> here's the irony of it. The satellites that we launch for climate change each rocket launch causes a certain level of um, pollution as well. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I know I know there are people in my group who are looking into nuclear powered um, rockets. I think that's going to come up in a big way because they are ever so slightly more efficient. They are a bit more risky um, in a, in a sense that if they go wrong, but um, but yeah. So I think nuclear propulsion is something that people are looking into. That's that's another thing you can look up online as well. The Leicester group for nuclear propellants um, has been coming up in a big way. That would be my suggestion. Becca, it's the question is, any thoughts on funding for climate science research, your views? Oh, goodness. <laughs> funding is a very sensitive topic for scientists. That is a very sensitive <laughs> one to end on. Um, well, I guess the most diplomatic way I can answer that is um, we always believe that we need funding for our own research we always believe that our research is the most important um that's in the scientific community we're constantly fighting each other for funding for any budget we um allocation we can get uh and climate climate change is no different um i wouldn't be working in this job if i didn't believe that my research was important um, that's what every climate researcher believes. Um, we're trying to make a difference. We're trying to basically 
without being too dramatic, we're trying to save the world. Um, so we're always hoping to try and fight for that extra funding. Um, luckily, we do have some uh, good funding bodies, um, but we're always we're always hoping for more. I'm going to not get into the politics of funding allocation right now, but um, yes, we always this is, this is we really always want our research to be funded because we believe it's important. <laughs> I think this is where a slight bit of, you know, government and politics science mixture comes up. Um, mm. it's, a, it's a touchy subject. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, um, so we have a few more questions coming up, but since we are done with time, so uh, if both Angaraj and Rebecca, if you think you would take questions on uh, your email, you can share this with me or on the chat if you want. It's up to you. Yeah, um, I think I'll give it to the to the organizers. We'll give yeah. we'll have to our emails. Yeah, and, I'm happy uh, to. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm also happy to send because uh, I, I think the questions were quite interesting and some of them were quite technical as well, which I'm very mm. impressed. Um, yes. So so I'll send a. I might. What I can do is um, I think it's Fridays for Future. Sorry, I should probably know that. Yeah. So for Fridays for Future, I'll I'll, I'll send them um, some of the links that Rebecca or her team or her senior scientists are are working on some of the direct results that you could have a look, uh, some of the data that we get directly from the satellites as well. So I thought that's something people, not only would people be interested, but if you are climate activists, you can actually use these data to, to make your stance. You know? uh, these are directly coming from scientists who are working on it. So, and, and we are more than happy for people to use them for any kind of uh, purposes. I'm quite certain most mm -hmm. of them are free anyway. Great, then thank you so much, Angaraj, Rebecca, for sharing your knowledge, your experience, giving so much time. Thank you, especially <laughs> to Angaraj also for helping out with the process. Um, and thanks to Fridays for Future. I was though not planned to be the host, but okay, that's fine. I liked it though. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you all. Thank, thank you, you all very for much for having us. Thank you. Hope to have you once again in future. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.